All right, let's talk to Father because I have a lot of material to stir up your pure minds with. And remember, if your mind gets stirred, there's purity in there. <laughs> Father, thank you, first of all, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you're doing something new. That you're changing, that you're upgrading, that you're, Father, increasing the quality of what you're doing. We thank you for the times of quantity, but we need the quality. And you're working on us to bring us to that place of maturity where quality flows from your throne. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying the course. Yes. Yes. Um, it's challenging me, and I hope it's challenging the prophetic in you. Because <clears throat> I believe God wants to bring us to a place where nothing can happen, but we know it first. He said, I'll do nothing, but I reveal it first to my servants, the prophets. But we have to be in a servant attitude to catch that. Okay? So let's... Prophets. Jesus Christ, the prophet. I've got an echo in there. One Number six. Uh, in Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. God is speaking to Moses and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all I shall command him. Do you remember what Jesus said? I don't say anything but what I hear the Father say. Now listen to the promise in here that I've missed all these years. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Acts 3 and 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Now listen, look, listen to this. Him shall ye hear. That isn't just with the natural ears, folks. It's hearing with the ear of the Spirit. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. That, if you read the Gospels carefully, it's clear that the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. But because he did not fit their preconceived eschatological ideas, they rejected him. I would suggest to you that that may well happen in some of the evangelical churches. Because he doesn't do it the way they have it all figured out. One day I'm studying this and the Lord says to me, Bill, if they had the problem then, and they didn't recognize him, is it possible that they're not going to recognize the end time stuff too? Because they have it all figured out. Okay? The awesome prophetic voice, thank you. That sounds great, doesn't it? The awesome prophetic voice has yet to be fulfilled. It states clearly that all shall hear. If you do not really hear it, he cannot require it of you. This means they will know the reality of what he is saying and it will conscious and yet will consciously reject the truth being stated. It's a choice they make. God is going to make things so clear. Romans 1 and 20 tells us that they are without excuse. Now, I don't know how he's going to do that. I honestly don't. But I do know that he said he's going to do it. Therefore, it will happen. I hope I recognize it. Okay? I pray I recognize it. All right? 
Jesus is always the first fulfillment of any of the fivefold ministry. We have looked to Paul for the example, we've looked to others for the example, and haven't seen how Jesus fulfills each one of the fivefold ministry. And I wrote a course. <laughs> Actually, I wrote five courses in going into that thought that Jesus is the pattern son, he's the example of all ministry. And he told me and showed me how to walk through the Gospels and pick out what he was doing under what anointing. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And it was, it was a life-changing study for me. He is the pattern for all, all ministry. His instruction concerning any situation should always be the first considered. It's not when you've tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. Do you know that was a song in the 70s? Yeah. He, he is the promised prophet like unto Moses. How a person is to manifest Jesus the prophet is something the Holy Spirit must make real to anyone he's called to the realm of the prophetic. There are multiple expressions, but it's Jesus prophets are to manifest. In every expression of the prophetic, Jesus should shine through. Jews acknowledge him. Let's look at this because sometimes we don't realize you know, we just read, we, we know our Sunday school stories too well. Right. So we don't read the Gospels, we hide in Paul. I mean, we. Okay? Jesus acknowledged him as a prophet in Luke 7 and 16. And, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, That a great prophet is risen among us, and that God had visited his people. Catch this. When God is moving in the prophetic, he's visiting his people. That's one of the reasons we want to have prophetic presbytery. Because we, we need that visitation of God confirming to your heart. When God confirms it, folks, you can move much more um, with much more confidence. Too many people say, I think this is the will of God. You can know without a doubt. Okay? They recognize that a true prophet is an expression of a visitation to his people. In John 9 and 17, they said unto the blind man, again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Samaritan woman acknowledged him as a prophet. In John 4, 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. There are some times when it takes perception to recognize the prophetic. Jesus declared himself a prophet. In Luke 4, 24, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Who is he talking about? Himself. Himself. This was in Nazareth. So he declared to, him, to them, if they hear, would hear it, that he was a prophet. In Luke 13, 33, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. I am a prophet, and I'm going to perish in Jerusalem. In this next section, the consideration will be the principles of the Holy, the Holy Spirit is highlighted along the way as he taught us the principles of the prophetic. So let's review the definition of a prophet. The Hebrew word shasa, meaning to see, to behold, as in a vision. Our problem, folks, is that often we take one definition and try and make it fit every prophet. 
That is unprofitable. All right. <laughs> the Hebrew word nava, which means inspirational, flowing forth. The Hebrew word natfa, which means to cause to drop. Although these are different words used of the prophetic office, the office is a combination and bigger than all the definitions. One of the things we must realize is none of these ministries have yet been fully developed and come to maturity. So we need to leave room for God to add to our understanding. If we don't, we will lock things in and inhibit our maturing. The general idea of prophecy is related to one who possesses a prophetic gift of ministry and who characterizes his ministry with some expression of thus saith the Lord. Now they say, well, I think God is saying. <laughs> I think we've got to come to that bold statement, this is what God is saying. Because if you think, you're giving room for them to say, well, it wasn't God. But you have to know yes. that you're hearing. Amen. Yes. Okay. Now I know we used to say, "Well, thus saith the Lord," and He was saying, but and nobody doubted. But then people begin to say, "Well, the Lord told me." The Lord. How do you argue with that? Right. We had one lady we worked with for 14 years, and God was always telling her stuff. And she used it to get out of any counsel we would give her. Finally, thank God, the Lord said, you can let her go. He made me stay with her 14 years. No, he made her stay with us 14 years. <laughs> you tried. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. <laughs> She and uh, a prophetess said to her one time, if you don't stop saying, God told me, God told me, you're going to end up in a psych ward. That's where she died. Wow. So he characterizes his ministry with thus saith the Lord, or I heard God say, or an equivalent rest, ref, reference to hearing from God himself. You can know when you've heard from God. Men, you know, there are those who see visions, those that have dreams. But with me, most of the time, the prophetic comes one moment, I don't know it. The next moment, I know that I know that I know. I call that the word of the Lord came unto me say. <laughs> All right. Apocalypse, whatever that thing is. You can read it. Pronounce it yourself. <laughs> All right. One who speaks from the impulse of sudden inspiration from the light of a sudden revelation of the moment. Remember that in Scripture the expression of ministry must be factored into the spiritual definition in order to fully grasp the extent of it. Okay? Note that in the book of Revelation, of the revelation of Jesus Christ and throughout Scripture, lightning usually signifies revelation being released and in revelation 4 and verse 5 it says out of the throne came thunders and lightnings in, and this is speaking of being in the last day so there's going to come an abundance of revelation in the last day god is going to speak there's going to be a true prophetic pure prophetic movement right now some are practicing well we won't go there all right <laughs> The spiritual definition of a prophet is one who shows the emotions of God on a circumstance, situation, or person. The apostle stands for truth, the truth of God. The prophet stands for the emotions of God, and the two walking together are balanced. That's why some apostles don't want prophets around. Because one of the problems with the apostle is he can become legalistic. 
but the emotions of God will balance that out. Here's a perspective on the seer that I took from something Bob Jones had spoken and somebody wrote it down. What is a seer? A seer sees, a seer is everything. Prophets are the eyes, but the seers are the entire head. The eyes, the smell, the taste, and feeling. That's what Isaiah 29.10 says. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he's covered your heads and the seers. A seer is everything. I like to use a hot loaf of bread to explain this gifting. With your eyes open, you can see it. But if your eyes are closed, you can still tell it's there, and you'll be able to see it with your ears. <laughs> I can put it under your nose, and you can smell it. I can put it in your mouth, and you can taste it. You can feel it in your hands. As a seer, you can move in all five realms, and because of that, you are more discerning. Remember that discernment is a spiritual gifting. It is not something you can do with your mind. It's not a deduction thing. And I say that because many operate in the gift of suspicion instead of discernment. We have got to learn to move in the purity of the Spirit of God. The Samaritan woman had her spirit peaked because she said, I perceive thou art a prophet. In other words, something beyond her natural mind and her natural thinking kicked in and caused her to see who Jesus really was. Discernment will cause you to know things that you cannot know by observation. And when God first began to give me discernment, I rebuked it of the, as of the devil. Because I thought I was being critical. Can anybody relate? Yes. I thought I'd gotten a critical spirit. I tried to cast it out. It wouldn't go. <laughs> and finally God said, six weeks I was doing this. Finally, God said, stop it. Just observe what I'm saying and see if what I'm saying happens in the meeting. Guess what? It did. Everything he told me happened in the meeting. That's how I learned to oversee meetings. I pounded it. He pounded it out in a meeting or in a church where prophets were on this side and prophets were on this side and the prophets on this side prophesied against the prophets on that side and the prophets on that side prophesied against, prophesied against the prophets on this side. Other than that, we had a good meeting. <laughs> that was in my first church. And all I knew is it wasn't, they weren't really prophets. So what the Lord made me do, and back then we didn't have computers, I got down in front of the oil burner in the church with a notebook, my Bible, and strong concordance and looked up every reference to prophets in the Bible. And he made me put it down in a notebook and I put space in between. He said, now go back through and I will show you the principles of the prophetic. So then I preached on or taught on being a prophet. And I cleared the house. The only one left was the one who didn't say they were a prophet. Wow. And then God began to bring them back with the right attitude. The truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. All right. <laughs> All right. Ponder this. There's a level of the vehicles God of God that we speak of that is released and available to every member of the body of Christ. This is where many get hung up. They think if they have visions, they're seers. Or they think if they have dreams, they're prophets. Not necessarily so, because Joel tells, it, tells us that he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And you old men shall dream dreams. You know how I know I'm not an old man? I don't dream godly dreams yet. Your young men shall see visions. I must be somewhere in between because I don't see those either. But are you hearing me? 
There's a level of that that's going to be poured out throughout the body of Christ. But there is the office of the prophet that brings the quality and the accuracy to a higher level. That is important for us to see. Because there are people who come around with a card and guess what it says? Yeah. Prophet yeah. so-and-so. And you could write that P-R-O-F-I-T or yeah. N-O-N-P-R-O-F-I-T. <laughs> because wherever they go, they don't minister life, they stir up strife. That's true. That happens. And see, God is a minister of life. If it's a ministry of God, it ministers life. Amen. Okay? Jesus didn't come that we might have misery and have it more abundantly. He came that we might have life and have life more abundantly. That is beyond abundant. Okay? And he came that we might minister more abundant life. So yet there is a higher, more refined, focused expression of those communica communication vehicles from God that define the prophetic office. It's not just accuracy. There's a refining. There's, a, there's a, an immersion in the word of God. Our course will focus on some of the differences and hopefully lift the standard and help us with discerning the levels of the prophetic. So let's look at the prophetic promise of a prophetic outpouring, a prophetic outpouring, okay? We've had outpourings, but this is a promise of a prophetic outpouring, and although the Spirit was poured out in the day of Pentecost, and they used these verses, it was not a prophetic outpouring. That's what I call a partial fulfillment. A partial fulfillment, and, you know, people have used that to interpret end-time events. You know, this is, was fulfilled there. That's why you've got so many, um, what do I call them? So many th theories of what's going to happen in the end time. Because they take some of these partial fulfillments and make them as though they're the full fulfillment. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said, this is yeah. that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. But... And he quoted the whole thing, uh, including blood and fire and vapor of smoke. None of that came. That meant that the day of Pentecost was a partial fulfillment. And that also means that there's coming a greater fulfillment. Amen. If there's a partial fulfillment and all those things didn't happen, it isn't that that wasn't partial fulfillment or it wasn't God moving, it's that there's coming a greater with a full fulfillment of it. And that's what we need to begin to expect in the days ahead. Okay. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour up my spirit upon how much flesh? Oh. Some flesh will get fleshier. <laughs> You're going to react one way or the other to the spirit of God. There's no neutral place. So if, if, some, if the Spirit of God gets poured out and gets moving in a meeting and you see flesh being fleshy, don't say, that's not God. Recognize that that's the reaction. It's like putting your fingers in a 220 socket. I guarantee you're not going to stand there and be, be, be still and say, oh, isn't this nice? <laughs> you're going to vibrate. Okay? Might even be a jerk. No. <laughs> Have you ever seen anybody jerk under the power of God? Yes. Yes. Back in the days of the camp, when camp meetings started with the Presbyterians and the, what was it, Presbyterian? Presbyterians and Methodists. Of course, back then, they, women had long hair. They had hairpins and all that stuff. And they would begin to jerk, and their hair would come loose, and it would sound like a whip snapping. But when they got up out of that experience, they were changed. That's the issue. It's not how high you jump. It's not how much you dance. It's not how much you speak in tongues. It's how you walk when you come out of the experience. 
Okay? So your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. The BBE version says, and after that it will come about, says the Lord, that I will send my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters and your daughters and your daughters Amen. and your daughters will become prophets. That's why they don't like to use this version in some churches. Because it allows for women in ministry. Okay? Listen, God's, God's going to use whoever he wants to use. Whether you agree with him or not. If he can use an ass, he can use any of us. All right. <laughs> Your sons and your daughters will be prophets. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. One of the commentaries uses the phrase, speak as prophets. The Hermeneic commentary of Joel 2.28 speaks of your sons and your daughters becoming prophets in the commentary on this verse. It's not just somebody saying it. These are men who've studied the original language. But sometimes in our translation, we translate according to our doctrine, not according to what's said. Right. That's true. So here's a guide to study. The definition of any word in the spirit should be approached in the following order. The word used throughout scripture sets the general definition. When, I, when God speaks to do a word study, I do not go to the dictionary. I do not go to the original language. I go to the scriptures and study that word throughout because it gives the biggest meaning for the word. It's usually greater than any dictionary meaning either from the Hebrew, Greek, or English. It's often a composite of how it's used in both Old and New Testaments. B, how that word is used in the original language often has hidden within it nuances pointing to the greater definitions. When God uses a word, its definition is usually greater than the English dictionary meaning. Jesus, Jesus took the word apostle and elevated its meaning. You will not get it out of either the Greek or the Hebrew but you will get it out of the study of how God used apostles in the New Testament. That God changes <clears throat> that definition. The same with prophet and any of the other ministries. And we've got to have his definition, not a dictionary definition. Right. Because in the end time, he's going to fill that definition and use every nuance of it. Okay? Understanding this method of approach should guide you to greater understanding of scriptures when God highlights it for you to study. I was talking to one of my spiritual sons and he said, finally the penny dropped. I said, what happened? He said, I was listening to such and such a course of yours and suddenly realized why you're trying to get me to study this way. <coughs> but it's a lot of work. <laughs> I said, I did it before there was computers. I did it with Strong's notebook and a Bible. But that's how I came, so that when the computer came along, I didn't have a problem. I was happy because I could search much faster. But see, God wants to teach us the wholeness of who he is. Not just a portion. Paul said, I fail not to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. We need to cry out to God that he would re-release re the whole counsel. Amen. God's use of and purpose for prophecy. Remember that the gift is a tool of God to do a work in the one wielding it. If you ever forget that, you become an object and not a person. What work is to be done in the prophesier while listening and releasing the word God gives through him? 1 Samuel 10, 5 and 6. And after that thou shalt come to the hill of God. This is Samuel speaking to Saul. 
Where is the garrison of the Philistines? And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with worship. A psaltery, tabret, the drum. My goodness, some people don't like drums in church. A psaltery, a tabret, a pipe, and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. That's the purpose of God in using prophets. Listen, how many know and have heard stories of God appearing, Jesus appearing, angels, angels appearing? How many have heard those? God can do all that by himself. He doesn't need me. Then why does he use me? When I asked him that question, and I did, he said, because of the work it'll do in you. This statement by the seer points to the fact that God wants to do work in the prophesier through the word of the Lord flowing through him or her. Don't shut that down. If you shut off the tap while the rusty water is still running, the pipe will never get clean. But leave it running and what happens? It cleans just the flow of the spirit. I mean, just the flow of the prophecy. I mean, just the flow of healing, just the flow of the word of wisdom, just the flow of the spirit of God through the vessel can clean the vessel. (coughs) Often we get so distracted with the function, we do not allow the work to be done within. So why did God place the prophet in the church? The why is for the perfecting of the saints, preparing them for the work of ministry, resulting in the edifying or building of the body of Christ. How long are they around? Till y'all come. See, Paul was a southerner. (laughs) Till y'all come. In the unity of the faith and of the experiential knowledge of the Son of God under the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. Now listen carefully. If he said it was possible, it's possible even if we've never seen it. We've got to come to that. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. If God says it's possible, even if I've never seen it, it's still possible and he's going to do it before he comes. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Why do we need them? Because sometimes they're irritating. (laughs) That we be no more children. We will remain children without prophetic. That we be no more children and that we may grow up into him in how much? Even the prophetic. Your challenge, no matter what God's called you to in ministry or function, should be, I want to grow up into expressing him in this call. So let's look at the call of the prophet. By the way, do you like my uh, illustration up there? (laughs) I found that in an old newspaper, and I've used it ever since. It's just really the quiet, whispering voice. God telling you, his secrets. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah 6, 5 and 7 through 7. Even though it's possible that he'd been prophesying already, this was the purging and cleansing of the prophet for the new call and the fresh commissioning. There will be a call and there will be a commissioning. They may not be at the same time. Sometimes there's a call a processing and then a commissioning. Sometimes you process before the call. We'll talk about that. In Jeremiah 4, or 1, 4 to 10, Jeremiah was called before he was formed in the womb. Stop and think about that. If you are called of God, he already had your name before the world began. (laughs) 
This is a case of predestination because of foreknowledge. Remember, whosoever will may come to salvation. But because he foreknew, them he did predestinate what to do? To be conformed to the image of the Son. Predestination is to the image of the Son, not to salvation. If God, God looks down, he sees my heart, wants all of God, and he says that one can go all the way. That one can go to maturity. He was ordained as a prophet to the nations before he was born. I wish there was some way I could just cause that to sink deep into your spirit. Ezekiel 2, 1 through 4, in order to answer the call, Ezekiel needed divine strengthening. Hear me, the same is true today of men called to be true prophets. A true prophet did not choose to be one. I'll just leave that there. The commissioning of the prophet, Isaiah 6, 8 through 10. In Isaiah's commissioning, there was a laying out of the parameters of the results of his prophetic ministry. Now, I really wish God would do this now. I haven't seen too many that know what their parameters are before they start. Okay? But he laid, if he laid them out under the old covenant, is it possible that he could lay it out under the new covenant? If he kept his heart right and these things happened, God considered him a successful prophet, although the world didn't. And maybe some of the church of his day didn't consider him a successful ministry. But when he walked in obedience to God, no matter what happened, he was successful. That is success. The power of receiving the word to change the life is emphasized here. But because they refused to receive the word, it made them spiritually fat, close their ears, and shut their eyes. Isn't that amazing? The same word can either make you come alive or make you spiritually fat. Some in the church need a weight reduction program. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad but it's fun let me be <laughs> all right the same is true today fat is stored energy that if not used becomes a weight that stays on and is actually stored on the body and it's hard to lose weight you've got many fat Christians <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road at all. <laughs> I'm just leaving that one right there. It has nothing to do with natural weight, by the way, just to make sure you understand me. The commissioning of the prophet, Jeremiah 1, 9, and 10. <coughs> this is the work of the prophet to the nations, to root out the weeding of God. Therefore, God planted a garden eastward in Eden before he created man. God planted in you a garden. There's a weeding out that may need to be done to pull down the dismantling of all beliefs. Isaiah 58 and 6. Just let me read it here for a moment. Because sometimes we need to see... Sometimes we, we read the word and we think we understand it. But when you define it with scripture, it kind of changes things. Isaiah 58 and verse 6. The fast of the Lord. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, 
to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Let me just say this, and we're going to hit this, I think, next week. But there's a difference between breaking the yoke and destroying the yoke. Mm. Yes. Many break the yoke and allow it to be repaired. Mm. But the anointing destroys the yoke. We need anointings in the last days that will destroy the yokes. So they cannot be replaced on people Amen. and cannot be repaired in our lives. <clears throat> to destroy destruction of the old ways, Isaiah 58 and 6 and also verse 9 in Isaiah 58. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. <clears throat> if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, <coughs> the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity, the destruction of the old ways, all your fault, take away from you the pointing of the finger. Mm -hmm. The only finger you're allowed to point is at yourself. Yes. To throw down, throwing down that which is not righteousness. Okay. Then the next stage, all of this was done so he could get to the building and planting. If I do not prophesy with that in mind, I may not be prophesying the word of the Lord. Okay. The edifying to build, the edifying of the body of Christ. We are the temple individually of the Holy Ghost, but we're also the temple corporately. And Paul over and over says, let all things be done to edifying or building. <laughs> the father was a, a gardener. The son was a carpenter. Just leave that one right there. <laughs> okay? To build and to plant. Planting of the garden of God in the life. <coughs> Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 12 to 5, 1, and Isaiah 58 and 12. Let me read verse 12 of Isaiah 58. And they that shall be of thee shall build thee old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. One day I'm reading that, and the Lord said, Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many denominations. How many know I did a tilt? There are denominations that started in a move of God. And they became solidified. But God said, every one of those that I started, those truths have to be restored to the body of Christ, and I'm going to restore the foundations of many denominations. There will be a group within that denomination that begins to stand for the righteous truth that God established when he started that movement. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. To some extent, this is the job of every prophet in varying degrees, depending on God's emphasis for that prophet. Examine this. Note that first there must be a clearing of the old. Four seeming negatives. Then a building and a planting. If we do not allow the four negatives, God cannot allow the prophetic to build in our lives. Note also that the same ministry that is called to tear down is called to build and to plant. Is this because God has given him a blueprint and he knows what the building and landscaping are to be? Those are serious questions, aren't they? The commissioning of the prophet, Ezekiel 2, 7 through 10. Ezekiel was given a roll to eat upon which prophetic writing was etched. The prophet must first eat his words.
That'll uh, kind of shorten your speech, won't it? John the Revelator was given the same type of book to eat, which also contained prophetic writing on it. Revelation 10, 9 to 11. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but thy mouth, in thy mouth be as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, I got indigestion. I mean, it was bitter. When you eat the word of God, as it becomes part of you, you could have in spiritual indigestion. Because it's changing you. Now listen to this statement by the angel. How many know angels don't lie? Angels of the God don't lie. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again, thou, John, must prophesy again <clears throat> before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The emphasis here was on prophetic ministry, not apostolic. And history tells us John went back to Ephesus and stayed there all the rest of his life and died. Well, how is this going to be fulfilled? It isn't fulfilled yet. Does that mean that before Jesus comes, John might be coming back? Well, let's just move right along. <clears throat> the definition of ministry success, and this is something we must get in our spirit because we're coming into difficult days. And we, this is why we need a recommissioning, even if we're already in ministry. We need a recommissioning to know what God's definition of success is for us and our ministry. That will give us the anointing and the ability to obey and the grace. With each of these men, we see that the calling and commissioning were two separate things. Each was challenged to accept the call. When studied extensively, a theme emerges that govern their life and ministry. Once the call is accepted, each was told what the results of their delivery of God's message would be. The measurement of success was whether they stayed true to God's word to them and through them and whether it produced the results he said it would. This is always the true measure of success in God. Growth in God, up in the corner. Growth always comes from the inside out. It cannot be forced. When we're working with people, we need to realize that. How many know that God says we're trees of righteousness? Did you ever ask him which type of tree you are? <laughs> are you a cherry tree? Cherry trees bring forth fruit in three years. Apple trees bring forth fruit in five years. Olive trees, 15 to 25 years. But I found out I'm a nut tree. <laughs> Takes 50 years to get fruit from a nut tree. <laughs> but we've, we've always considered it being one type of tree, haven't we? We've not asked God what he's planted in the orchard of CMC. Or... With those who are online, Lord, what trees, what righteousness, what, what expression of trees of righteousness are they? Remember, there were two trees in the garden. At least that's what everyone focus, focuses on. But there were many trees in the garden. And they weren't all evergreens. There are multiple trees. When you read Song of Solomon chapter 4, verses 12 to 5 1, you see that the garden of God is described there, and that garden is your life. Those plants and their spiritual equivalents are planted in you, they're planted in a local assembly. And God wants to bring forth all of those from a local assembly. But we have focused on only being one type of tree. Therefore, when someone didn't fit what we thought was the type of tree, guess what? We chopped them down. 
Hello. All right. <clears throat> growth comes from the inside. Remember, growth is pro progressive and cannot be forced. God has no quick grow or miracle grow when it comes to maturity. He doesn't have instant potatoes. He makes you grow them and get down and grub in the dirt. Oh, I got a story to tell you. I was with a group of people that believed in farming and, you know, were headed to the wilderness and we were going to stay out there until big bad Antichrist had made his mess and we were going to come back and <laughs> fix the world. <laughs> Trouble was, we had some people that lived in the city. So I went to visit and minister at this house and they had bought the lot next to them and planted and they planted potatoes and they planted tomatoes and they said, we planted potatoes, but we didn't get anything. I said, did you dig them? Dig them? They didn't realize, oh <laughs> they didn't realize potatoes grew under the ground. <laughs> so I took them out and dug some potatoes for them. We often try and do things without knowing what the fruit ought to be. You're going to be laughing about that all night, Matt. <laughs> He's going to be thinking about it. <laughs> so God has no quick grow or miracle grow when it comes to maturing. You cannot skip any stage. We may not spend a long time in that stage, but must go through each stage, especially if we're called to function in the realm of the seer or under the spirit of prophecy. We grow up through each stage, building on the foundation of the maturity gained in the last stage we went through. See, some of these things, they're... When you stop and think of them, they're logical, but we've never thought them through. Preparing for the fullness of anointing. Does Gloria have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gloria? <laughs> Did you phone? Uh... She said. Okay. Jesus, in his operation in the prophetic realm, had resting upon him all seven spirits of God, as well as the spirit of prophecy. Those maturing into the prophetic office are having God prepare them for the anointings to rest upon them. Each of them will have a theme from God for their prophetic expression. And when they come to maturity, one or several of the seven spirits will rest upon them to take their ministry beyond what they've seen in the prophetic current. There is coming a dimension of the prophetic that is beyond anything we can really grasp yet. It's, and, and by the way, it's not that Jesus could not have expressed them, it's that he reserved certain things for the end time. Otherwise, he could not say, greater works than these shall you do because he wouldn't have left any greater works. There are some things that are reserved for the end time. Some manifestations of God, some manifestations of the glory, manifestations of maturity of ministry, and manifestation of the glory of God in his church corporately. And one of those things will be, he's going to bring it together. Right now, it's I say the body of Christ is like Jesus on the cross. All the bones are out of joint. All right. The seven spirits of God define Isaiah 11 and 2. The spirit of the Lord, the covering or overall anointing. We're going to show you some illustrations here that 
really help me. The spirit of wisdom, wisdom is depicted in Proverbs. The spirit of understanding, understanding is depicted in Proverbs. The spirit of counsel, counsel is, is depicted in Proverbs. The spirit of might, as in Samson and David's mighty men. By the way, the spirit of might is God's anointing for spiritual warfare. And we've not won battles because we've not accessed what's available. The spirit of knowledge is depicted in Proverbs, and the fear of the Lord is depicted in Proverbs. Now, why do I use Proverbs so much? Because Proverbs is the book to the sons. Over and over, you'll hear the refrain, my son, my son, my son. Therefore, the son is being prepared for the throne. And as I said one other week, I just finished my revelatory commentary. I thought it was going to be a course. But after two years and 196 lessons, I think it's a commentary. <laughs> but the things I discovered as God took me through the instruction to the sons, and there's a progressive instruction, uh, a maturing, you can tell where the son is maturing and what he's maturing into by the instruction as it goes through the book. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal study. So consider these truths. These are not gifts of the Spirit. I, when I was asked to teach, these are not gifts of the Spirit. I, when I was asked to teach uh, some men at a place, they listed the, in the advertisement the gifts of the Spirit in Isaiah 11 and 2. I went to him before he got that out, and I said, no, they are not, they are not the gifts. These are anointings. They are fullness anointings. Okay. These are anointings of wholeness. Each of them is said to rest upon, and this is a definition of anointing. An anointing from God rests upon one, giving them abilities beyond their natural capability. In order to better understand, we need to examine the base scriptures from which these are defined. Shall rest upon. When something rests upon, it can be taken off. This means that these are anointings that God causes to rest and are not necessarily abiding anointings. Over and over in Scripture, we're told the Spirit of the Lord came upon someone and they manifested one of these attributes. Listen, there's a lot God's getting ready to do. I just want to be in a place where I can steward it properly. Amen. So, illustrations of the seven spirits of God. The umbrella. Can you see how that would work? Then Zacharias 3.9 talks about the seven eyes in the stone. It says these are the seven spirits of God. Also in Revelation 5 and 6, it talks about eyes. Okay? Are there seven areas of vision? Well, we won't go there. Seven spirits as well. <coughs> Pardon me? Well, we, we'll get to that. We're coming there. They do, but what, what we're looking for... See, they're released in the end time. In chapter 4, they're around the throne. In chapter 5, they're released. And what are they released to do? Exactly what it says. Throughout the whole earth. Seeking those whose heart is perfect towards God. Upon them, he's going to rest those anointings. Deal with your heart. Let God deal with your heart, and you will be prepared for the anointing he wants to rest on you. Revelation 4 and 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay? They must be pretty important with so many illustrations. Seven spirits, the anointing for the last days, Isaiah, or Revelation 5 and 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, 
and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth, here we are, sent forth into all the earth. And that's where Second Chronicles 16 and 9 comes in. Okay? Horns are symbols of power throughout Scripture when seen upon an animal. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, has seven regions or seven aspects of power that are the seven spirits of God. Much uh, I go into greater extent in this in my first chapter of Revelation. Um, it took me 21, te- 21 weeks to teach the first chapter of Revelation. Could it also be interpreted as power and authority? Absolutely. You said power, because the word power also be interpreted as authority in the last slide. <coughs> yes. Okay. But it's, it's bigger than that. Okay. okay. Each of these are aspects of the seven anointings or seven spirits that God wants to rest upon a people. Otherwise, the, the seven spirits wouldn't be going throughout the earth to seek out those whose heart is perfect towards God. He's looking for a heart upon which he can rest that will steward the anointings. In the prophetic realm, they would function in tandem with the spirit of prophecy. As one grows up in the prophetic, each stage of growth would help prepare and strengthen them to be able to wear the mantle of anointing that helps to express the theme of God, the theme God has for their prophetic expression. In Isaiah's theme was the coming of the Messiah. The anointing of the seven spirits that would most likely be the strongest resting upon him would have been the spirit of the Lord. An anointing to reveal the lordship of Jesus Christ as Messiah. Daniel's theme was the revelation of the dominion of the Lord and the triumph of the saints through all the attempts of the enemy of our soul to destroy us individually and corporately. Note in Daniel 7, 18. But the saints of the Most High shall... What? Take the kingdom. kingdom. Oh, you mean we're going to have to exert some effort. It's not going to be handed to us. What's the other scripture about taking it by force? The kingdom of God Um, suffers violence violence and the violent take it by force. Do you know what that word violent there means? Mm -hmm. To be violent with self. Mm -hmm. Does that put a new spin on that? Because the kingdom of God is where? Within. Within. What opposes the kingdom of God within? Self. And when the enemy comes in in Thessalonians, it says he exalts self above all that is called God. Okay? God's enemy is not the devil. Never has been, never will be. He is our enemy. But our flesh, our carnal man, cannot understand or accept the things of God. Okay? But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. The anointings released in full manifestation in the last day We will need every anointing that God has made available to his people in order to win the battles, the war, and step into the dimensions of overcoming that he's destined for his people. Anointing from conquerors to overcomers. There are certain qualities and aspects of the seven spirits that God indicates how he will use them to enable his people to accomplish his purposes in the final days. The final days will be days of full release of the power of the enemy of our souls. It will necessitate 
the release of God's power to be more than a conqueror. Yeah. Romans 8 and 37. Nay, in all these things we are what? More than we, we wouldn't mind just being conquerors. Yeah. <laughs> in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than those who gain a decisive victory, which is what conqueror means. The progression is from conqueror to more than conqueror to sevenfold overcomer. And by the way, the steps of overcoming are Revelation 3 and 4. To him that overcometh will I grant. Overcoming is an attainment, not an automatic. By the way, God doesn't use automatics. He uses standard shift. All right. He uses standard shift. I'm bad. But I'm having fun. Leave me alone. All right. Okay. How many can recognize that in that little chart in the corner... There's a whole mess of lessons. Okay? And God wants to bring us... By the way, when you look at that, the first step of overcoming is the revelation given to the Ephesians that they lost. The book of Ephesians is the highest revelation of functioning in the body of Christ in the Scriptures. Can you print that out bigger? Yes, I can. I, I I can. No, I understand. I understand, dear. I just wanted to get it up there to get you thinking. Can you put it on your phone and stretch it? It's still too small. Yeah. It's still too small. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> but that there's a whole a whole raft of teaching there on overcoming. To him that overcometh will I grant. Overcoming is my choice. God gives me opportunity. And sometimes I whine. By the way, you know how to spell that, don't you? Yes. W-H-Y-N-E. Why? Cheese. Why? Cheese. cheese. <laughs> whine and cheese party. Instead of whining, I need to say, Lord, is this an opportunity to overcome? And the simple illustration is this. I'm sitting on the platform. How did I get here? I stepped on something, and it came under me. Oh, that's good. Okay. When you go up the stairs, you're overcoming. That's the progression. All right? I haven't got time to teach this, but we did, uh, when I did um, Revelation around the throne, no. Jesus, Revelation of the Seven Churches. I wrote six courses on the book of Revelation. Because God finally convinced me to do something with Revelation. I fought him for oh, probably 15 years because I'd seen all the, I'd heard in Bible school, I heard all the opinions. You know, this and this and this. And I said, God, I'm not touching that book. I've seen all the mess it can make. But then I relented and I said, well, if you give me a key, I might do it. Right the next day, guess what I got? A key. A key. So I gave him another request. <laughs> and he gave me that one. And he put it together for me. But you see, we've tried to interpret the book of Revelation by itself. It cannot... One day he said to me, he said, Bill, why do people disregard 65 books of definition? Oh. Everything before the book of Revelation is definition, definition for what he's preparing to reveal in the book of Revelation. And we just discard it and have our opinions. <coughs> and have we messed it up? Yeah. Yes, we have. Yeah. 
Anyway, Father, Lord, we recognize that unless you anoint the yokes, unless you anoint, the yokes of the world will never be destroyed from off your people. Come, Lord Jesus, and release all the power of your Holy Spirit expressed through these seven anointings. Break the yoke of the world, the flesh and the devil, off your church, your bride, and your sons. Each of these yokes require the fullness of anointings to destroy their hold on your people. Lead us into that level of your character and nature that will enable us to walk under these anointings for the last days we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Are there any questions? She's oh. picking on me, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bless you.